Good morning, everyone. You're in for a real treat today as we celebrate the beginning of this marvelous Christmas season. You know, you end the season and you think, well, that's it. That's it. Over. And it turns around and comes back to be all over again and brand new and wonderful in every way. You're going to hear a unique prelude, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, arranged by our organist, John Dill. And I've asked John to come join me here at the microphone and give you a little touch of the background that we just learned about as he was arranging that uh, beautiful Christmas piece. A little hand for John, the pipe organ. So Pete asked me to play, I mean, to arrange something for the, this orchestra because it's unique in the fact we don't have brass because of social distancing. So, so we had to oh. reduce things. <laughs> I forgot. Anyway, um, so, <clears throat> so I said, what about O Come, O Come, Emmanuel? It's one of my favorites. And he said, yes. And I said, great. And, and in the process, your brain does weird things when you start thinking about how to put these together. And I literally woke up with it running through my brain and how it would happen. And so it just so happens that I... Uh, there's a piece of music called The Moldau by Smetna. And it's a wonderful piece of music from the Czech Republic. And, and it, was just, it has this flowing section in it. And you'll hear, uh, I echoed it. I didn't steal it, I borrowed. And, <clears throat> well, his is in 6-8 and mine's in 4-4, four, four, so. <laughs> At any rate, in the process of doing that, uh, just before I was starting to write it down, Lucy passed away. That's his sister, Lucy Swindoll. And we had become friends on the uh, Reformation tour in 2010 in Prague, which is where Smetna was from. And so I thought, well, that seems like something I should put together. And so it just so happens that I studied with a, a woman in uh, North Texas. Her husband's name was Maurice Durifley. And he had worked out an alphabet for notes beyond H. And so Lucy's name came out D, E, C, and A. And if Kevin would play them for us. So you'll hear, that is Lucy's name. And so you'll hear it woven in. And it turned out really nice. <laughs> so. Anyway, thank you. I'm tempted to say, listen up, Lucy. But since when can I tell her what to do? So glad you've come. Your heart will be touched, blessed, encouraged, and you'll be uh, rejoicing. You'll leave better people than you've come. And that's what worship is about, at least partly so. Glad you're visiting with us. If you happen to be among our visitors, come again. We hope you will. And we are delighted with everyone's presence today. Uh, let's bow together, pray for these who are going to be making the music for us, leading it, playing it, singing it, presenting it. Lord, you created music. The morning stars sang together. We can only imagine those multiple billions of stars singing. And today as this fine choir and these instrumentalists so competent and capable blend voice and instrument to set forth songs of the season. May our hearts leap within us as they remind us of our Savior 
lead through these who conduct, sing through those who bring the message to us in voice, play through the fingers and lips of those who provide the instruments. And may this be a time when we truly give thanks for Emmanuel, God with us. In his name, we commit this time together and this prayer. Everyone said, Amen.
When I was a child, the neighborhood we lived in had a community pool. So just about every day during the summer, my friends and I would go down to the pool and spend hours and hours. And of course, kids make up games to play, right? So one of the games we played was to see who could hold their breath the longest underwater. What a silly game to play, you know. <laughs> the winner ends up being the loser because, you know, they're, they're out of oxygen and everything. But, but you've done that, haven't you? You've taken a, a deep breath and gone underwater, and then just the pressure begins to build, and there's this longing for the fresh breath, and, and finally you, you burst above the water and, and take a breath. It's so refreshing. In many ways, it seems like our society these last 10 months uh, have been kind of holding our breath with this COVID. Uh, haven't you sensed that? that there's just a, a pent-up discouragement and frustration, and we're, we're just hoping to, to break through to something new and, and, and vital. One of our prayers in putting this program together was that this might be an hour in which you can come up for fresh breath, you know, just emotionally and spiritually just to breathe deeply. Uh, the, the pandemic, we hope and think it will soon be over and we'll get back to normal, but it's been a difficult time, has it not? And uh, it, it, to me, it's made the message of Christmas uh, even more attractive and even more uh, clear. We want you to sing some songs with us. Uh, we're gonna sing three traditional Christmas carols. Sing these as if it's the first time you've ever sung them, all right? Sometimes we get accustomed to these words and uh, let, let's sing it as if we're seeing the lyrics for the first time. Would you stand please and we'll sing together.
Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight o'er all the earth. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. 
We sing of them, we write them into our songs. Virtually every one of the carols we, we sing include those, those intriguing creatures we know simply as angels. If you looked closely on the platform, you noticed in a niche on your left back toward the rear, you'll see, well, at least someone's idea of an angel in in some shape with wings, as always it seems. And over in front of the pipes on your right, you'll see another, well, a replica of somebody's idea of angels. But I've never met too many people who've ever seen one. Artists have these uh, marvelous imaginations and like Raphael always paint them with halos and a glow about them though we never read of either one in the scriptures. In fact, part of the issue of angels and understanding them is dealing with a lot of the false information that accompanies them. Like, they're they're not dainty little fairies. They aren't wood nymphs or water sprites. They certainly aren't chubby little cherubs with pink cheeks and tiny wings and looking for people in love so they can shoot their cupid arrows at them. That's all fantasy. It's all a myth because they are magnificent. Sometimes fierce. On occasion filled with compassion, and, and they rescue us. The psalmist says in Psalm 91, 11, he commanded them to give us protection so that the angels were given charge over us. We grow in our understanding. People tell us, There are guardian angels, probably so, not just for children. Cynthia and I were laughing this morning as we thought of our four while growing up and how busy the guardian angels were in their lives. Our last two needed several ranks of angels to assist them. They were busy. But it's far more serious than that. Angels comes from a word, angelos, out of the Greek New Testament, which simply means messenger. They're that, but they're more than that. In fact, uh, some are named Gabriel, Michael the archangel, Lucifer, son of the morning, who fell and dragged with him a third of the heavenly hosts who changed from angels to demons. That's another subject for another time. They seem to be in groups. Cherubim, who fled the throne of God. Seraphim, with their six wings. With two, they cover their faces. With two, they cover their feet. And with two, filled with eyes, they fly. Like I say, they, they are intriguing creatures. But to the point, what was sent from the presence of God, his name was Haangelas Gabriel the angel Gabriel, he did what angels do. Here's a simple little formula. They show up. They step up. They speak up. Then they scoot. <laughs> no reason to hang around and have a piece of pie and a cup of coffee. They're, they're not into that. You wish you could have time with them. And they aren't like the FedEx driver or the the guy that drives a brown truck and delivers a UPS package, rings a bell, and then gets out of the way. They don't bring something. They deliver 
something far more significant than what is tangible, and that's God's message. Gabriel was sent from God to the town of Nazareth, sort of a backwater village on the, on the fringe of the Roman Empire. Not a place you'd write home about. Matter of fact, you and I would probably refer to it as more of a dump. Had a red light district. Not far away, about four miles, was a Roman garrison at Sepphoris. And when the soldiers went on liberty, probably came to Nazareth to buy cheap wine and cheaper women. So it didn't have a good reputation. In fact, one of the men who was later called to follow Jesus was informed that he was from Nazareth. He said, well, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, one young teenager did, somewhere between 13 and 15 years of age. She was still a virgin, though engaged to be married to Joseph, a pure man who loved the fact that he was marrying a Parthenos, a virgin. Never intimately a new man. So when Gabriel was sent from God to Nazareth, he was told to find the virgin engaged to Joseph. And a little later in the, in the narrative, he's given her name, Mary. But he's told the quality that attracts the Lord to her, and that is she's a Parthenos. We become so familiar with the story that we toss these words around like they mean little to the Virgin Mary from whom the child Jesus was born. Well, how else could God have brought someone on this earth without a sin nature if it had not been through the genius of a virgin birth? Never happened before, will never happen again, which confused Mary. Angelos Gabriel said to her, I come from God. Greetings, favored one. If you look closely in the original, you'll see tucked away in the word favored is the Greek word grace. God's showing grace to you, Mary. It's not that you're all that significant, but your virginity is essential. Mary's confused. Uh, she, she doesn't understand why grace is being shown to her, probably thought me of all people, young teenager. And listen to this. You will become pregnant. You will have a son. You're to name him Jesus. Jesus. She remembers her teaching, the teaching that was poured into her in the synagogue school about the Messiah. Jesus would come, and now she hears, You will be the vehicle, your womb preserved in purity, will bear the child. She, she doesn't get it. In fact, if we were to respond today, uh, like probably a teenager would respond, she'd have three responses. Wow. Now? How? How's it going to happen? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a virgin. You seem to forget Oh, no. It's remembered. It's essential. You see, Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of God shall overshadow you, so the baby born to you will be utterly holy. That's it. It 
You see, Gabriel was equipped not only with information of where to go and to whom to speak. He was also told how it would happen because angels wouldn't normally know that. They're curious about a lot of things. And so he comes equipped with everything, including the information Mary needs. And when she hears it, there's no argument. There's no struggle. There, there's no discussion. She says, I, get this, I am the Lord's servant. May it be, as you have said, may everything come to pass. I am willing. And then you know what happens? Whoosh! He's gone. Scripture says, he disappeared. She's gone. He's gone. She's there. By the way, think about that. It was all done in private. We have a record of it. It's been read for centuries. But when it first happened, there was no sky writing so that all people in Nazareth could read it. It was her word against the world. And what a price that was. First with her parents that night at supper. Um, Mom and dad, um, I'm pregnant. But it, uh, their, their heads are reeling. Think if you were the parents. She says to them, oh, the Holy Spirit will come upon me and, and uh, the Lord will overshadow all of it and the Holy One born will be the Son of God. Then the grandparents, we don't read about that dialogue. And then Joseph. Joseph at first couldn't, couldn't believe it. Decided to put her away quietly. We'll look at that next time. Because an angel plays a role in his life. And then could I add the whole world of their day would sneer. Read John eight forty one, when Jesus is now an adult and ministering and, and they're arguing with him about his identity and, and they say to him, we're not of illegitimate birth. We know who our father is. See, he lived with that. He bore all of that on our behalf. God stepped in time and did what only God could do, a miracle. And he brought the baby to us from a virgin's womb. One final thought. It would be easy to be envious of angels. I remember growing up thinking, it'd be great to be one. I'd like to fly around and deliver messages and do amazing things. But you know, uh, I was just reading in 1 Peter 1.12, which says they, they peer with interest into the gospel story because they, they're not... Jesus didn't die for angels. They don't have souls. They have wills. So they obey or disobey, but they're not able to be saved. That's reserved for us, sinners as we are. Years ago, a song was written. It was 18, 1894, as a matter of fact, that the composer wrote of all of this Holy, holy, holy is what the angels sing. And I expect to help them make the courts of heaven ring. But when I sing redemption's story, they will fold their wings 
For angels never felt the joy that my salvation brings. Has salvation come to you? Or are, you? are you entering this Christmas season singing about Christ and angels and the Lord and a virgin birth and all that without knowing the Savior? Oh. No wonder it's just another season. Let's take care of that right now. Bow with me, will you? Just for a moment, close your eyes. Wherever you are right now, just close your eyes. You who are watching online, just close your eyes. Think. Has Christ come into your life? Was there ever a time when you said, yes, Lord, I, I, I long to have forgiveness and a purpose for living, and a reason to go on and sins forgiven and a home in heaven. I'd love that and thousands of other things that you've promised us. Please come into my life, Christ. I accept you as my Savior. I take the gift that you have given me, O oh God. And then this Christmas, thank him as never before for the greatest gift of all. Let's pray. Father, thank you for that, that, that holy night, that uh, special moment when there was a gush of birth and, and a miracle landed on straw. Thank you for Jesus, who would grow up loving us and willing to die for us, that we might know the life that only he can give. We are grateful, and this Christmas season, accept our thanks. In his name, we pray. Everyone said, amen. As our friends at home online are giving to the ministry, listen to the beautiful strains of O Holy Night.
We are very grateful for your presence here today. Thank you for coming. Our final song is entitled, And the Glory of the Lord. You've probably heard it before. The music was written about 300 years ago. It's written by Handel. It's part of the Oratorio Messiah. The lyrics, however, were written thousands of years ago, first spoken by the prophet Isaiah. You'll find the text in Isaiah 40, verse 5. There are three phrases. <laughs> the first is, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed. The second phrase is, and all people will see it. The third stanza is, this is happening because the word of the Lord has declared it. First phrase again, the glory of God will be revealed. In retrospect, we know that he was talking about Jesus. He was the glory of God. All people will see it. That includes you and me. And then all of this will take place because the Lord has spoken it in his word. Yeah, what a wonderful way to end this program. We have a wonderful tradition here at Stonebriar, and that is whenever the Word of God is spoken, or in this case sung, uh, in honor of His Word, we stand. So would you please stand as the choir and orchestra sing this final number?
Thank you again for worshiping with us this morning. If you're looking for purpose and friendship, we'd love to help you connect with our church family. We offer many online groups, events, and resources for all ages throughout the week, and our staff is here to pray and care for you. To get started, visit our website at stonebriar.org. Our church's mission is to love God and love others, so we look forward to sharing His love with you.